The other one just ended. Sorry, long time no see everyone. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> I, I, I see, Patrice, you're still in the same place you were the other meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Nicole, are we close to quorum? Uh, we need one more individual, one more member, I should say, Thank you. to join. We have four, four members, we need five. And we have Bisa, but I know that she has to leave at two. So it'd be great to get one other member. But we can begin. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say, I think it might be. <laughs> might be a good idea to get started uh, and see what we can get to before the hour lapses. Uh, so welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Diversion Subcommittee uh, meeting for the month of September. And I am your host because <laughs> Stephanie can't be with us today. And she asked me, uh, you know, if I would, if I would mind sort of walking everyone through the agenda, certainly I said, sure, uh, if there are any future subcommittee members here, you know, use it, don't abuse it. That's all I'm saying It's the first time it's ever happened for Stephanie. So it's all good, I think. Um, uh, so uh, while we get started, why don't we uh, do a round of introductions and I'll see if uh, after that, uh, Nicole wants to, you know, go over a, a really important announcement with you guys. Do you want me to help with the roll call? Sure. Questions? Okay, Bisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Kira. Good afternoon, everybody. Ellen. Hi. Good afternoon, Ellen McDonald, uh, interim public defender. I'm. Uh, taking over for Robin um, Lepetsky, who retired a couple of weeks back. Nice to see you all. Misha. Present, Tamisha Walker, Executive Director, Safe Return Project. Michael. Michael Pearson, present. Cheryl. Cheryl Sutton, good afternoon. And I don't see DA Becton online. Had you heard from her, Chris? I know she had a presentation today, correct? Uh, that's right. I haven't heard from her substantively just to change uh, the the one-on-one -on -one calls that I've been trying to set up with all of the members just to change our, uh, our scheduled time, but that's about it. Okay. Um, for the sake of time, did we want to have others uh, introduce themselves in chat? Uh, sure, that's, that's fine. Um, and that'll, I think that'll give you time to go ahead and sort of talk to us about what's, what's about to change. Nicole, you want me to take it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, unfortunately we haven't had an opportunity to share this with the, with the full body during the, um, during the full body meeting. So we're doing this now through, uh, each subcommittee meetings. Um, but, uh, effective, um, uh, September 30th, so the end of this month, we will all be moving, all advisory bodies will be moving to in-person meetings. Um, so that will affect all of our jobs uh, meetings, general body, as well as um, your subcommittee meetings. Uh, Nicole has done an awesome, awesome job of securing all of our meetings, um, including subcommittee meetings, um, uh, same time, same dates. So you won't have to worry about that. Um, however, it will be at the downtown administrator's office, um, at the new CAO's office. Thank you, Nicole. She just posted the, the address there. So uh, your, next, um, your next monthly meeting will take place at this location that's included in the chat. Um, we will need to know from you all whether or not um, meeting in person is going to pose any challenges for you. Um, there is a virtual option um, for members um, to attend uh, as well as the public. However, if you do choose to join uh, virtually, um, your location will have to be publicly noticed as well, um, which means it will have to be open to the public to attend should they find your location to be suitable for them. So um, Nicole has just issued a poll 
We ask that for um, all of our subcommittee members to please respond to that so we can get a sense of um, any conflicts that this may pose for you. And then we will work with you offline um, to find or figure out uh, sort of a workaround for you. Um, but we are anticipating um, that um, that executive order uh, will expire uh, September 30th and uh, we'll all move to in-person meetings um, subsequent to that. So that's the latest and greatest. So we'll give folks a little bit of time now if you can to go ahead and respond to um, the poll um, that should be in front of you. Hopefully you all can see it. This is for all the subcommittee members. We ask that you please respond. I'm showing seven, which is seven members today. So I'm gonna end the poll. Thank you for your participation. And do folks have any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none, Chris, I'll take it, turn it back over to you. All right. Has her hand up. Oh, yep, there it is. <laughs> Go ahead, Cheryl. Um, I was just going to say that the, actually the executive order, there's two of them actually, um, that, and both of them are on the governor's desk now for, for signature. And I, I know this because our, our uh, council told us last night in our board meeting and we heard it a couple of days ago from our from my my work board meeting but from our board meeting our special districts board meeting yesterday we heard about this same thing and so it may be it may come down to the wire on whether or not he, uh, the governor uh, extends the executive order but there was a second part to it that it, it may depend on whether the county um, determines whether gathering in person, uh, the county health department determines whether gathering in person is um, is not advisable, uh, and uh, so that's the other side of this. So we were told that we were supposed to not only look for the governor's uh, executive order, but it, because he if he signs one or two, because if he signs one of them, it comes down to what the county department of health says. So I think it's we we're supposed to be on the lookout for that. So I guess we're waiting for that, and then waiting for you guys to tell us what we're supposed to do um, with with respect to meeting in person and or the remote option. Yes. Thank you, Cheryl. Well, Jill or Alicia, um, do you guys have any insight on that? At least from the what we could potentially expect. Um, we just heard, um, yeah, we just heard from um, our lobbyist in one of our the Board of Supervisors subcommittee meetings um, that there is legislation sitting on the governor's desk. And that was um, on Monday um, prior to the election that um, they anticipated he was gonna sign to allow continued some form of hybrid meetings going forward. So it was actually a piece of legislation, not, not an emergency order is my understanding, unless Alicia, you have a different understanding. No, I was in that same meeting and that is what I heard. We're just kind of waiting for the signature. I would anticipate, I think they anticipated that we would know something this week. Yeah. It's, it's AB361 and AB339 for the record. So then do we anticipate if um, in fact the governor signs then, then from the Board of Supes we just follow that, that order or that legislation? I know Supervisor Anderson has expressed um, a, a, um, an interest in continuing at least their Board of Supervisors subcommittee meetings um, virtually because it allows county staff to zoom in to meetings rather than drive all over the county. Um, and so I know that is the preference of Supervisor Anderson, but I'm not sure which legislation will get signed and what will be allowed at this point. 
Cheryl, what was, can you post in the chat what, what um, assembly bills um, or AB bills those were? Yeah, 361 and 339. Thank you. Yeah. So as soon as we hear more, we will certainly um, alert all of you. Um, and um, if it is um, where we can continue uh, virtually, we certainly will make that accommodation. Um, but we certainly wanted to be sure that we were on top of everything should we have to move to in-person meeting. Either way, we're all good, we're set, and we'll certainly update you all as soon as we get further notice. All right, uh, well, um, that's sort of a perfect segue if necessary um, with agenda item number two, which is public comment. Um, so at this time, uh, anyone from the public who wants to discuss um, any items that are not listed on the agenda, please feel welcome to do so. Uh, Dale, I see your hand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, what would be the uh, masking requirements on meeting uh, uh, in person? Masks are required for all indoor gatherings, regardless of vaccination status at this point in time. Thank you. Which is why the Board of Supervisors have stayed virtual so that they don't have to sit in board chambers with masks on at this point in time. Yeah, I, mean, I just wanted to state, I did check out the space. Um, and it, it's going to be a challenge with mask on in that space for everyone to hear each other. Um, so, but if, if we do have to go that route, we'll just have to speak up. Uh, another good segue. Any more public comment? Does anybody need to speak up at the moment? All right, seeing none, um, I suppose we can move right along to the next agenda item, which is approval of the record of actions from our previous meeting. Uh, so I would ask that folks take a, a second to look at the record of actions just to Familiarize yourself with that. Um, let us know if you see anything that needs correcting or anything that is left out that needs to be added. Uh, and if not, certainly I would entertain a motion to approve the record of actions as it appears in the agenda. I make a motion to approve the agenda items. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Is there a second? I actually have a correction. Okay. Um, I think it shows me absent as the chair, and I wasn't the chair at that time. That's right. Um, so. My apologies. I will fix that. It was Stephanie was the chair at that point, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. It's been so I would make a motion to approve the minutes after the amendment stating that Stephanie, Stephanie Melody was the uh, chair of the meeting. Thanks again. Any, any second? I'll second that. All right, Nicole. Um, can you take a roll call vote on the motion to approve the record of actions with the amendment about uh, the proper chair? Yes, Lisa. I abstain, I was absent. Kira? Aye. Ellen? Aye. Dina? Is that a yes? Yes. Yes. Misha? Aye. Michael? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. 
Motion carries. Thank you. Yes. Nicole, did you say motion carries? I think yes, I, I did. I'm sorry. Motion carries. Okay. No, I just think I missed that. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so next on the agenda is uh, to receive the presentation on county diversion programs for adults from the DA's office. Um, I know that uh, there are some materials that are in the agenda. Um, and DA Becton, if you wanted to share your screen to, you know, display those if you needed you know, them as a visual aid while you talk us through these things. So uh, I hope I'm not surprising Nicole when I say feel free to, to give that a shot. Okay. Um, sure. Let me, I mean, I thought I had that open, but it's just a very. I can bring that up. Okay. But it's the PowerPoint, right? That just lets me, guides me through what I was going to say. So that would be great. Thank you. Now I lost, where's my Zoom go? Uh, it's just two pages. So thank you for bringing that up. Dina Beckton, District Attorney. And I was asked to share with you today about the diversion programs that we have um, currently within the District Attorney's Office of aimed at reducing recidivism and shrinking the legal system. Uh, and also I'll talk just a little bit about alternatives to incarceration. So I'm ready for the next slide, please. So I'm not talking about number one and two because today our focus is on adult uh, programs. So um, what I'd like to do is to skip down to um, prosecutorial discretion in charging to talk about the changes that we've made there. They're not really a, a program, if you will, but they certainly are aimed at diverting folks away from the criminal justice system. One is um, our um, um, drug, drug policy where uh, it was adopted in 2019 so that for people who get arrested for standalone minor offenses uh, related to drugs like uh, um, possession, um, pos possession of devices, um, being um, in, in public under the influence, 11377s, 11350s, all of those things were certain exceptions. We're not filing uh, those charges. Um, um, we give people up to uh, three uh, arrests in a 12 month period where we would not file those charges. Instead, we are referring uh, the individuals to health care for treatment as opposed to criminalization. So those are cases that are diverted away uh, from the system based on prosecutorial discretion. The other ones that I wanted to talk to talk to you about in terms of the discretion and charging is the declination of uh, charges policy. Um, we did a few things just to move a number of misdemeanors away from the criminal justice system. First, having to do with the kinds of cases that we, we would come in that would come into us around driver's license, unlicensed drivers, and people who had license suspended for other than a DUI. Uh, that those cases, instead of bringing them in as misdemeanors, we bring in as infractions so that they go to traffic court. And then also um, for uh, other. Um, crimes that are low-level misdemeanors, uh, again, um, we are de declining uh, those charges unless there are two or more multiple violations within the 12-month period. Those would be, you know, the um, uh, shoplifting cases that uh, fall under uh, $300, uh, petty theft cases in those categories, uh, disorderly conduct in public, that kind of thing. If we have people in our communities that uh, are chronic, um, chronic um, arrestees, then uh, we work with our law enforcement partners to bundle those cases. Otherwise, we're uh, not charging those types of cases. Um, as for um, the uh, corrective solutions is uh, currently the 
a diversion program that we have to divert the low level uh, offenses away from the criminal justice system. It um, is a program that um, has a, a fee associated with it. So we have been trying to move away from it. And I'll tell you the progress about that we've made about that. But uh, we have worked with the providers so that um, one, we've had the redu fees reduced to about a third of what they were. We have also had them um, adjust the letterhead to uh, advise people if they do not have the funds to pay that that is not a deterrent, that they will not be turned away from the program. So um, that is the alternative that we have for cases that we would file, but they fall in certain categories. Um, and we divert those to a program when people successfully complete the program, uh, attending a class, et cetera, um, then they are not charged with a crime. Um, the neighborhood courts uh, is something we've been trying to get up and running now. We received the CCP funding back in 2018, but working uh, through uh, some of the obstacles in hiring our coordinator, uh, we have finally just this week uh, after three years, uh, been able to hire the coordinator so that we can begin to roll those out. The neighborhood courts will then become our primary source for diverting cases away from the system. Um, it will be, we'll be fanning out uh, into uh, different parts of the county. We want to establish the first three courts, one in West County, one in Central County, and one in East County. Um, they will not be of a cost to those who are participating. Um, citizens will uh, receive training. Uh, citizen volunteers to be the arbitrators in these courts would receive training in restorative justice practices and uh, lenses. They would then sit on panels of three to hear the cases, um, determine and try to get to the root cause of what is causing the behavior and then fashioning a remedy. If the person uh, completes um, the remedy, which just depending on what kind of case it is, uh, could vary, um, then no charges would be filed. So those are the main things that we have. I know we've already heard from the Public Defender's Office regarding uh, mental health diversion and Veterans Court. So I won't be, although we participate in those uh, uh, programs and courts, I won't be mentioning any additional information other than what we heard last month. Thank you, DA Becton. Um, are there are there any questions from uh, start with committee members uh, based on what you just heard? Thank you so much. I have a few questions. So um, I'm excited to hear your neighborhood courts are, are getting off the ground. Um, is I'm wondering about how cases will be referred and if that'll happen with certain law enforcement agencies only to start. Um, and then um, what you think the timeline is to start having cases um, heard in the neighborhood courts. Well, the, the coordinator has not hit our doors yet. So we haven't even had our first meeting. Um, I figure um, the, with the rollout that we have to do, which is actually pretty a heavy lift because we have to recruit uh, the citizens that are going to be willing to give us their time uh, in order to uh, be the arbitrators of these cases in their various communities. We will also have to have the startup time to train them. And then we also have to find uh, facilities. We have to find a safe place for the neighborhood courts to meet in each part of the county. So my best guess is that we would get those up and running by the end of the year. Although, you know, because we haven't even sat down and started to, you know, map it out, I'm just really taking, giving you my best cast guess. I think there was another part. Oh, it is not, it is a DA-led program. So we're talking about cases that have been referred to us uh, for prosecution. And this would be an alternative to prosecution. Great, and then can you remind us the parameters around types of misdemeanors or would it be any, any misdemeanor could be considered? Uh, we will be meeting with our justice partners like you and probation and, you know, inviting you into those conversations to, to talk about them. But I mean, certainly a lot of what we've already talked about here 
it, it wouldn't that we don't really need to use say the drug cases or anything like that because we already have our policy around those but uh certainly it would be a lot of the low level offenses that you've heard me mention today thank you mm -hmm. any other questions for me okay thank you that was quick i have some um oh. <laughs> yeah, no, I was just I was just trying to defer to the uh to the to the subcommittee uh, if members had questions and certainly if if they think of some or are holding some, um, you know, they can take the time that they need. Uh, so in the uh in the drug policy, you mentioned that there were uh exceptions, and I'm curious what those exceptions may be um uh as far as the the policy for not filing up to three arrests for standalone minor offenses related to drugs? Sure. Well, the first one is, is you know, the person that is a repeat customer. So if you get three or more, in, you know, in a 12 month period, of course, those would be an exception. Um, there could be uh, other charges that are associated with the arrest. So um, most of the time for this program, we're talking about a standalone uh, drug charge. But if there are you know, are other types of charges that are also associated with the arrest, they, they have to be evaluated individually based on the um, those arrests. Uh, we also consider, you know, uh, priors. And then we also consider any other public safety concerns that are not necessarily articulated, but that might be communicated as part of the arrest. Okay. Um, and for corrective solutions, you mentioned uh, diverting people to a, a program. And I think you mentioned that a lot of times that is a class. I'm curious what uh, types of classes those are or tend to be. Um, and if there's any any need based on uh, who's coming through those programs for um, you know some similar types of programming or specific programming around uh, whatever you're seeing. Yeah, so if they have, um, sorry, um, if you give me a minute, I can get the actual names of the classes right up in front of me. But basically, they um, it's more of a, um, uh, an awareness class. Like, so you become aware of how, you know, your behavior um, is uh, affecting your community. Um, so it's that kind of a, a class uh, that they attend. Uh, they have been able to move online, which has been good. Um, and I should also mention that we are discussing with them, they are personalizing a program for us uh, called the John School that is related to the work that we're doing around human trafficking. So that will be another form of diversion uh, for us as well. Um, we um, have not uh, finalized the John's program because we are getting it personalized for our county. Um, so we uh, look to go into contract with them in the next two weeks and then um, um, establish exactly what our boundaries and criteria would be. It would also be a class may aimed at awareness so that people understand how their behavior affects and harms their community. Uh, and because it's all part of an accountability piece before we decide not to file the charges. Thank you for that. Um, and as far as the neighborhood courts, uh, I'm curious, um, like what steps are being taken or what plan there is in terms of how the recruitment is done for uh, the citizen volunteers um, who will be, I mean, it seems pretty central to that process mm -hmm. um, and making sure that uh, there is, um, you know, equitable sort of racial and ethnic group representation uh, on those panels. Yeah, I, I think, um, thank you so much for that thoughtful question, because I think that's going to be probably one of the um, most challenging parts of setting up the neighborhood courts is the recruitment and, you know, making sure that the outreach that we're doing reaches, you know, our communities in a way that we're able to hopefully be addressing the kinds of issues that you just raised around race and equity. So we're... Um, 
again, the coordinator hasn't come on board yet, so we haven't had our first uh, strategizing meeting, and I'm going to be welcoming some of the partners who are at the table today um, to also uh, be thought partners with us on how we can go about best doing the outreach into the different in two different parts of our county so that we do get a diverse representation uh, in our counties. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of so preliminary, it's hard to say, but I'm going to be definitely welcoming any thought partners who might want to be at the table with us thinking about how do we best reach out to our communities as we go about recruiting people to serve as the arbitrators. Thank you. Um, and this, this may also be too preliminary to ask, but I'll ask it now. And that way, when you do meet with your new coordinator, if you know, just in case these weren't going to be on the list, they'll be top of the mind. They, they're on our list, absolutely. Um, so do you know who uh, or what organization or agency will be leading the restorative justice trainings for uh, the citizen volunteers? Um, top, the first choice is Impact Justice, who okay. um, has worked with us on our youth restorative justice program. So we're very familiar with their work. And again, if there are any other ideas or organizations that you know of, we'd be more than glad to get those suggestions too. But that's our uh, um, first thought about who will help to train. Got it. All right. I, I think that finishes my questions. So I will again pose uh, before we uh, before we open it up for public comment, I will pose back to the committee members uh, one last chance to uh, to ask D.A. Becton about uh, anything that she's presented on thus far today. All right, I don't, I don't, I, I, Cheryl, I was literally about to look through and make sure you were still on this call because I just figured you would not let this opportunity pass. Uh, so the floor is yours. Boy, I must have a, I have a crazy reputation. <laughs> good afternoon, D.A. Becton. Good afternoon. Similar to Christopher's question about equity, um, when it comes to, to the to the program, I, I'm interested on the other side of the program, right? How do we ensure equity and the participants in the program, right? So it's, it's one thing to have participants in the, in the community court, but how do we ensure that those who are afforded the opportunity to go through our, any of these diversion programs, but particularly we had a conversation last week um, in our racial justice coalition meeting that there seems to be more diversion programs available for youth, but not so much for adults or those who have crossed over that 17 barrier, right? So what are we doing to make sure that we are, we are giving, uh, because this is the racial justice oversight body. One of the things we're charged with is making sure that we're looking at why we have so many black, Latino, indigenous, and people from underserved communities in our criminal legal system. So how can we make sure that we're giving these opportunities in these diversion programs that you've named because they sound great, but what do we look, how do we make sure that we're looking at it through an equitable lens? Mm -hmm. Because we sure are overrepresented in the criminal legal system and we're underrepresented in these diversion programs. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing to, 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 to flip that around? So thank you. Um, I think one of the things, because we did a lot of thinking about that very question when we were setting up our youth restorative justice program, uh, working with the RISE Youth Center and also Impact Justice um, about how do we ensure that when we are evaluating the youth that we take into the program, how do we make sure that we are kind of applying the same criteria uh, to everyone that comes in the door so everyone has that equal chance. So the way we um, approach that uh, with the strategies that we use really uh, centered us around um, 
having a developed criteria for entry into the program so that you didn't get excluded, you know, because of this or that. And really trying to have a wide net as to who comes into the program uh, within the perimeters of what we think is acceptable. And although I, and I'm not trying to skirt your question, but it is part of why I want to invite into the conversation as we move forward, especially with the neighborhood courts, our thought partners, uh, many of whom are at this table today that help us to wrestle with those kinds of questions to say, how do we make sure that when we open the doors for these programs, we are really uh, addressing the racial and ethnic disparities that exist in our system and making sure that those all of the communities have an opportunity to be represented even in those not only just in those who are the arbitrators, but those who are also coming into the program. And the other part of it, um, it, which is not here on the board yet, because I didn't want to talk about things that have not yet happened, but um, certainly we are mindful of the, the, the very, very great disparities for those who are 18 to 24 year olds who come into our system and also have the right, highest rate of recidivism. It is why I have asked to um, receive the Measure X funds, and I believe we are trending pretty high uh, to be able to stand up that program as well, which will be modeled very, very much after our youth restorative justice program. But for that age group, as you said, that has slipped from juvenile and into the adult years, 18 to 24, where we see the greatest number of uh, youth who, and the greatest number of disparities and the greatest amount of recidivism. So we are hoping to serve that group as well and hoping to get those fundings to be able to do so. Thank you. I think that's, and, and I wanna add one more, the greatest number of, of recidivism, greatest number of people in the season and the greatest number of black and brown bodies yeah. coming through that criminal legal system that's right so i, I think this next question is not just for for you dave Dickton, but it's also for this 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 subcommittee because i think that um as you say yeah we need more thought partners in figuring out how we keep this we how we stop the tide of this black and brown bodies coming through this system and part of that is is not just um looking at a criminal record right because if you have a criminal record at 12 13 16 17 years old and something happens and now somebody is looking at the totality of your record and and i know that uh, miss ellen knows this when we're looking at participatory defense and you have somebody who does a you know who who is not black or brown right and who has and you're looking at them and they may do a crime at 22 24 and he might be a white body. And, and somebody saying, well, he, he had all these crimes when he was youth, so he's more of a threat. But it, so th th there is no equity there. If you start looking at, oh, they had a bunch of petty crime when they're young, mm -hmm. and so here's a danger. Rather than looking at the circumstances that might drive someone, and that is where you have mental health issues, or, as somebody who deals with uh, wounded warriors, there's underlying reasons why I like this veterans court. And there's underlying reasons why you have someone who's coming back from being in killing zones who, who you can't just, you can't just uh, shake that. I grew up with a stepfather who did two tours in Vietnam, who grew up, who, who would wake up in the middle of the night in night terrors. And I say that to those of you who, who have never, if you have never seen somebody, a grown man wake up in the middle of the night in night terror who sleeps with a gun under their pillow. And as a child, that can scar you as a child, nevertheless, as a grown man who saw his own brother get killed in front of him at the age of 19, that can do something to you. He was one of the fortunate ones who was able to not be pulled into that. So there's a story behind each one of these people. So to to brand them as criminals or to brand them as something wrong with them when they are out killing at the behest of this country and to just throw them in a jail or prison cell because they're doing what they were trained to do is something I can't get with. 
because we are not taking into account the totality of the circumstances. So I hope that this Veterans Court, and, and maybe I need more information about what it's planning to do, but especially this Veterans Court needs to have something more than just, we will put you in, in a, another cell and not giving you the, the services that you need. So I hope that these type of diversion programs is something that is keeping them from going into the system period. But there's a story behind each of these, especially when we're dealing with veterans who are coming back from these killing fields. And they have so much more that, that we need to be dealing with. Thank you. If there's something more that we need to, to know about this veterans court, I would like to hear it. Thanks. I actually have a question, if I can. Um, actually, I want to commend you, um, um, DA Beckton. I, I really, I'm looking forward and I'm excited at seeing these programs roll out and see some, some substantive change. I, I'm really excited about just kind of that shift and, and like your slide says, shrinking the, crim the criminal legal system. Um, I, I do have a question on the, um, on the use of prosecutorial discretion, is that going to be on an individual uh, DA, or is it going to be on the a committee, or is there a team, or uh, how, how is that going to um, how's that going that piece going to work? Mm -hmm. Well, we've actually um, it, we've issued it in our office as a policy. So these charges, this is what you do with these kinds of charges. So it, it's. It is it's discretion, and I guess the, the discretion is really coming from me because I'm saying that these kinds of charges were not going to be filing. So we've issued it as a policy. Okay, thank you. And 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 done the training as well, because these are the kinds of cases that usually our uh, newer prosecutors would be taking a look at. And so we've also trained them on you know what that policy is and how they can use it and implement it as well. I wanted to respond to Cheryl about the Veterans Court. I think um, the Veterans Court is a, a very robust, holistic court, and it does fill an important gap for the population that you were describing, um, but it's, it is within the criminal legal system. So it's after someone has been charged, they are sent over to Veterans Court. Often it's a probationary term where at the end of it, it can be um, either diverted or dismissed and we do clean slate relief. Um, but I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And there is a population of folks who have um, been, you know, they've served our country, they've been um, veterans. And, you know, I think there is an opportunity for us um, to look and see um, if we can divert folks before the filing stage, which we know is the best practice, is going to keep them from having that barrier. Um, I know one of the challenges from, um, you know, where our office sits is often identifying who is in fact a veteran, and we do that when we first meet them through screening, but I think for the criminal legal system, trying to identify who that population is um, to divert them early is something we would have to um, look at and maybe put our heads together and be creative. But I do um, hear what you're saying and think that having an earlier um, outlet from our system for the, the veteran population is something we don't currently have. We have another type of diversion for lower level cases for veterans, but that's also after things, charges are filed and the cases have moved into the, the system. Thank you. Thank you. I'd be glad to work with you on that and put you in contact with some veterans organizations that can help you with that. Wonderful. Any any other questions from committee members? All right. Uh, so at this time, I'll take any uh, any public comment on the DA's presentation. Patrice, I see your hand up. 
Hi, thank you. And thank you, DA Becton, for your presentation. I just wanted to echo some of the sentiments that were shared earlier. We just got off of a, a, a CAB meeting um, just prior to this meeting um, where there was a lot of discussion around um, restorative justice programming in the county, or at least wanting to see an expansion of RJ um, programming um, in the county. And so um, I, I hope I can certainly direct some of these folks to, to your office um, if you're looking for some um, thought partnership uh, from community members who would definitely be interested in, in um, helping to shape uh, both the neighborhood courts work and then, as you mentioned, if received um, the Measure X dollars for the TAY um, RJ programming. Um, I, I certainly hope I can put them in your direction. Thank you. That'd be great. Any other public comment? All right, uh, I don't see any. Uh, so with that, thank you, uh, DA Beckton, for, for sharing that presentation and taking our questions. Uh, I think you've given us a lot of uh, stuff to think about in terms of what these recommendations can look like and what the, the future of diversion can look like within the county. Um, so we really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and uh, along the line of what uh, diversion might look like. Uh, the next agenda item is to review the working draft of diversion guidelines. Uh, so I'm going to ask Nicole if she could share her screen again and put those up uh, for us. Uh, just based on the, the last conversations that we had um, and, and sort of some of the concerns that folks were expressing, I, I made a couple of uh, draft changes for your consideration and always want to hear people's thoughts um, and uh, what sort of items or concerns or concepts you think should be represented uh, in this document. It's your document. Um, so I'm not married to any of this language. It's just here for you to consider and to think about. Uh, happy to edit, to change, to revise um, as you all see fit. Um, so I will just quickly walk you through sort of the, the red letter changes um, from what this looked like the last time you all saw it. Um, starting with uh, 1B, which says the county should be intentional about including PLC led organizations as well as uh, programs run by persons previously incarcerated um, when we're talking about diversion programs. Um, so to the extent that there are community-based organizations that can help to provide uh, diversion, we know it's a best practice for diversion programs to be housed within community. Um, and just wanting to spell out when we're saying community and when we say community-based, there are some things that we're implying uh, that could still maybe not actually come together if we don't spell them out, which is why we're specifying in 1B, POC led organizations, programs run by persons who were previously incarcerated, right? Who, who have that experience and an understanding of what the needs may be uh, with the populations that they work with and can, uh, can execute on those. Um, and if you keep scrolling, Nicole, I think there should, yeah, there we go. Um, so 3B, uh, so 3 itself says all diversion programs should collect and report race and ethnicity data on all program participants, right? We always want to know uh, by race and ethnicity who is getting the benefit of uh, a diversion program. Um, that's information that we tend to ask. Um, and, you know, we get a range of quality of answers, right? Because clearly there's not... Um, you know, necessarily within every diversion program, uh, an emphasis on this at the moment. Um, but this also says qualitative data. 3B says qualitative, qualitative data should be collected to determine why attendees who do not complete the program are unsuccessful. Um, and this data should be used to update various aspects of each program as needed. Uh, just means stopping at program failure, um, especially like as a data category or people who are unsuccessful um, just leaves us with more questions than answers, right? So we had, say we had 
we have a program and there are 30 participants or we've had 30 people come through the program 20 people completed successfully 10 did not okay why like what what information do we have as to why because that helps us to figure out what changes we may need to make or implement uh or what problems may need to be addressed at a larger uh county level in order to make sure that folks are successful so just catching that and saying we want to make sure that we have that level of information or those questions are being asked um and then four um is eligibility criteria for diversion programs should be reviewed and analyzed for racial impact unless those criteria are mandated by statute uh and 4a the review and analysis again saying the the quiet part out loud or the implied part out loud the review and analysis should then be used to update eligibility criteria to ensure racially equitable outcomes um so what i meant by it when i um when I was drafting this is it would be nice if for every piece of, uh, for every criterion, right? Uh, individual criterion that uh, for which a person could be uh, ruled ineligible potentially for a diversion program, we should know uh, what the racial impact is. So if that, if, if you know, you put a certain criterion like uh, must be, you know, one or less offense, you know what I mean, or something like that, then how many how many people from communities of color are being left out immediately with that particular criteria, right? Um, and what does that tell us about whether or not we need to keep that, tweak it, change it, adjust it, right? Um, and the same with every, you know, piece, unless, it's, again, unless it's mandated by statute, we realize that sometimes um, statutes or state laws uh, determine to some degree what uh, or who is eligible for a diversion program. Um, but to the extent that there is discretion and folks are developing these things, there needs to be an understanding of for each piece of, uh, for each requirement that we have or each standard that we have, what the impact is, right? Who's being excluded? Who absolutely must now be detained uh, in, or be uh, uh, denied the opportunity for diversion because of this particular um, uh, discretionary sort of policy or or, um, or criterion for diversion. Um, so that's sort of my thoughts on these. Definitely wanting to hear um, other people's thoughts or questions. Those are just things that sort of popped out uh, based on some of the, the discussion that we had last time. And certainly, again, you can delete all of this if you want. Um, you know, I'm not married to it. This is you guys' document that will come from this group. Uh, just trying to give you some things to uh, to start with and to see what additional uh, changes or revisions or additions you want from here. Cheryl. Well, since the group is just being very, very quiet today. And... Uh... I don't know. I know Patrice has to leave, so I don't know if she has anything to say before she leaves. Okay, good. I was just being polite. <laughs> so here's my initial thought on this, especially uh, number four, number three B. Um, I think we, we definitely need three B so we can it can inform number four. This is this is for me personally, because we know from the data that we do have, uh, and I know we still are collecting more data and uh, more up-to-date data, because we know from the data that we have that there's substantially more um, black and brown bodies in our criminal legal system, but there's less black and brown bodies in our diversion programs. It is imperative that we have 3B. It's got to be more qualitative. Well, I mean, we get quantitative data a lot, but we got to have not just qualitative data, but quality qualitative data, right? That drills down and tells us who is participating in these programs, the extent that they're participating in the programs. And as, as you've captured here, when they're not finishing the program, why not? 
Why aren't they finishing? Are the parameters around the program so burdensome, so onerous, that it is that they're being set up for failure from the very beginning? And if that is the case, then maybe the programs, not the individuals, need to be uh, looked at. I refuse to believe that only the 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 white male who are caught in the criminal system, criminal legal system are the only ones who are eligible for diversion at a high rate. I just refuse to believe only the black and brown males at the highest percentage. Of course, there are other people who are getting caught in the criminal legal system, but I, I happen to be a scientist and my scientific brain tells me that this is just not possible statistically, that those are the only people who get in the criminal legal system who who happen to be be able to go through our to be to qualify for the most diversion programs and who are able to get through the diversion programs? Something tells me that 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 doesn't work. So what is going on in our diversion programs that make them the only ones who are or the most not the only but the most qualified at the highest level at the greatest percentage and who are finished? So that we need the data to help us figure these out. The other thing is, is that we either need to look at the eligibility criteria for these diversion programs to figure out, are they inherently creating bias? And, and this uh, skewed racial impact? And then who is creating the eligibility criteria? Are the people who are creating the eligibility criteria already coming in knowing who they want in the diversion programs and not even realizing that when I create these criteria, I have already pre-selected who is going into the program. And so it's not even the, the program itself, it is the persons who are writing the criteria and then the criteria is already skewing the, the program, and then the program is skewing the participants. So the participants, again, we go back to the beginning, we're setting them up for failure from the very beginning. So all of that comes back to these racial impact is going to be affected by bias criteria from the beginning, which is affected by human beings by their very nature are, have a certain bias. Um, the review and analysis, whoever is reviewing it cannot be the same people who wrote the eligibility criteria. So who is gonna review it? It has to be independent of whoever wrote it because if I can't grade my own paper, if I'm gonna grade myself, I did fantastic. I get 100% every time. So we gotta be careful about who are we letting um, do the review and analysis that we say we're going to, to update the eligibility criteria. If we're saying we're going to ensure the racially equitable outcomes. And that ties right back up to 1B, making sure that those who are most impacted have a voice in the systems that are policing them. So they have to have a voice to say whether or not it is fair. So I think they're all tied together, even if they're tangentially tied together. That's it. Thank you. I really appreciate those points. Um, I think you made some, some really great points there. Um, and I, I'm wondering if folks have any ideas or if you, if, if you have any idea uh, in terms of some additional language here around uh, some of the things that you brought up, specifically around um, who is creating or developing eligibility criteria and how that process can be more inclusive, right? There, there seems like we need an additional recommendation around something like that, right? Something that's not currently before you, um, yes. as well as, um, uh, uh, as well as who's who's doing the review and analysis and and uh, of of those eligibility criteria and you know who should be responsible for that. 
So I think it needs to say something um, right after it should be reviewed and analyzed by an independent. So the eligibility criteria for diversion programs should be reviewed. So it, first of all, it should be developed, right? The eligibility criteria for diversion programs uh, should be, uh, so who's developing them now? Where's Ms. Ellen and uh, DA Beckman? Who's developing them? I guess that's the first, the first, the first question I have is who's developing the eligibility criteria for these programs? I think that's the first point of research we have to figure out, right? Christopher? Oh yeah, I'm with you. I'm just nodding my head because didn't need to be on mic to agree, but yeah. Yeah, so first we need to know who's developing the eligibility criteria. And then I would say eh, that's the first one. So if there's there's room for input, if there's room for input. On, on the development of the eligibility criteria that's, like you said, that's not mandated by statute, then that is room for uh, the impacted people for, for programs, uh, community-led programs, for other voices, like some of those of us here who represent uh, the voices of the people and who represent uh, the voices of the community, then there, there is room for that here, whether that's uh, the probation office, the, the public defender's office, uh, those of us from racial justice organizations, then there's room for that here, right in the development stage. Then there should be an independent panel that consists of those same type of voices who are reviewing and analyzing, but it cannot be the same people who are developing it. You understand? That independent panel should be reviewing and analyzing the impact of that eligibility criteria on the actual implementation of the, the programs. And then the third level would be the annual or periodic review to make sure that there's an update. It's the same thing that we, we advocated for with the bail review, right? It's the same type of, of tri-level tri review. Does that make sense? Sir? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so my my I think the only question I have around that is um well, number one, I'm curious, especially with the connection that you've made to uh to to bail issues, I'm curious if there are or if there's a group that's well positioned within the county uh currently to do that sort of review work. Um because I think uh, otherwise, it seems like we would or you guys would be suggesting or uh, trying to create a new panel for it, which may not be uh, a problem. But I'm curious if there, if there are folks who are already assembled in position to do this kind of work uh, who might be able to take this on so that there's not a reinvention of the wheel. I'd have to think about that. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't think about it. I don't know the, I don't know the answer to this. Um, one of the things that occurs to me and Patrice before she left just sent me a, a message to maybe talk about some of the, the prior diversion work that, that some of the folks in this group and throughout the county had done on Contra Costa Lead Plus, Coco Lead Plus, which was the law enforcement assisted diversion efforts um, that included um, government stakeholders, community-based stakeholders, uh, the Racial Justice Coalition, um, and others. And as part of that, we put together, um, after a lot of um, deliberation and meeting and robust conversation, some eligibility uh, criteria for who could participate in the law enforcement assisted front end um, diversion program that, again, no longer exists, but our materials do so. Um, Patrice said, uh, Christopher, that she could send you a copy of those guidelines um, to review if you thought that was um, helpful. That only addresses one piece. I hear uh, Cheryl's point about having a community-based effort, an independent group, and some researchers. And I think that's a different um, answer, uh, but it, that does address a part of, of, the, um, of what was raised. And another piece that, that may 
you all may have discussed before as a group and maybe in these guidelines is a question around not just studying very um, in depth who is um, granted diversion, who participates in diversion and what the outcomes are, but then the other group, the group that doesn't qualify for diversion that is sent through and referred into our criminal legal system and who have charges filed. So I think if um, research is conducted on both groups, it might give us a better sense of how the policies are impacting um, our community members um, as a whole. So I think studying both, if that is um, a possibility, would obviously be um, ideal. Yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. <laughs> Um, so I, I appreciate all that. I would just ask, uh, for some feedback, um, from this group or from this body, uh, as far as, uh, the materials that Ellen just, uh, you know, offered to, to share, uh, around eligibility criteria, or at least the eligibility criteria that were developed for that specific lead plus program. Curious if that's something folks would, uh, be interested in um, looking at as a large group and sort of discussing because it could it could lend itself to um, you know to these recommendations in terms of saying we think something along this line or something similar to this should be uh, developed um, and and I mean I guess Ellen that's you know whether or not you're you know obviously we're, we're talking in real time so I don't know how comfortable you would feel with that but um I would love to see it. I'm curious if other folks would would like, um, you know, a chance to to review something like that and to discuss it. I would. Well, I'm not on this committee, but I do know there was an enormous amount of work that went into that lead plus, and there was, um, you know, they worked really hard along the way to make it work and and changing things as they needed to. So I think it was a, it's a, I would love to see that work go to good use since it sort of just all fell apart because of funding. I would I would love to see that used going forward. The the lessons learned. I think it's super important. Um, not to put you on the spot here, Ellen, um, you know, as the newest uh, member of the RJOB and of this subcommittee, but uh, would you be, would this be something you'd be willing to sort of present on to some degree? Um, and do you think you could do that for, uh, for next month's meeting? That might be a, a good next step on all of the work that you guys have done that, that probably has some significant impact on the work that uh, uh, the subcommittee is trying to do. Oh, absolutely. I'm happy to present on that. I do think, though, you know, Patrice led that project and um, she would actually be someone um, that I think you would want to hear from um, maybe even before me. But I'm, I'm, of course, happy to present. And I um, know that we had very robust discussions and some of the, um, you know, eligibility criteria, I would probably even be arguing could be more expansive than what we landed on, but I do think there's value in, in kind of looking at where, where we landed with so many um, different stakeholders in the room. So yes, I'm happy to help. Thank you. Yeah, I, I will definitely follow up with Patrice. She had to, she had to, uh, to, to leave to a, another engagement. Um, so I, I don't mean to leave her out of the process. It's just that she's not here to speak for herself, but we'll make sure that uh, between the two of you, I suppose that we uh, that we get on the same page about that, so that we can um, we can get some information about um, th those eligibility criteria and how they were developed. A quick question, Ellen: Did did she lead that from her, the the from the office of reentry, or did she lead that from? So we would need to have that conversation now that the office of reentry is under probation and what she led outside of that. And so, yeah, we definitely would have to have conversation prior to just trying to put this on to the next agenda item to, to have her present. The, the ORG was part of it, but she okay. was part of it as the reentry network. So Dante Blue was involved with the ORG and she sat on the, the board as the, um, the representative from reentry East County, East Central. 
Thanks, Joe. And it is all public documents. They were all public meetings. So there's nothing, nothing that couldn't be shared. Yeah, and it wasn't necessarily of anything being shared. It was just more of who should be the one doing, you know, representing that, because that would be something that, you know, if it's going to be Patrice now with her role of us would be a conversation we'd have to have with uh, Chief Krause uh, as well. So not that we, she couldn't do it, but just making sure that everyone is in the loop before we agree to something. Uh, yeah, note to self for me to follow up uh, with an email, try to copy everyone. I think we need to include trusting you guys to CC folks as necessary um, to sort of start the ball rolling on that conversation so that hopefully next month, um, this is, you know, some information that we can at least start to, uh, to dive into. Uh, was there any other public comment? Uh, in fact, I don't think I even asked for public comment on this yet. I think I've only been talking to committee members. So uh, public comment on uh, the diversion recommendations as they are currently presented. All right, I don't see any, I don't think. All right, so next on the agenda, were you, Cheryl, are you raising your hand? Okay. Um, next on the agenda is next steps. Uh, I think we've, we've mostly covered uh, what they would be. Just want to make sure that I'm stating them again so that I can write them all down and I don't miss anything. Um, so next steps are going to be to follow up uh, with uh, Chris, sorry to interrupt. Was yep. there were you going to discuss the our job future work planning and coordination? Was that something? Was that part of next? Uh, session? Kind of. Thank you okay. for reminding. Me. <laughs> kind of. Um, I, I'll just say again. Um, okay. I've been. I've been. Uh, I've sent an email out to most of you. I think I, I may have missed Ellen, uh, but I'll send you an email shortly after. Um, just because I wanted to, like we talked about in the uh, in the last quarterly meeting, uh, one of the things that we discussed, right, in addition to having perhaps a, a second chair for each uh, subcommittee, um, you know, and and having those uh, those follow up sort of agenda planning meetings uh, or restarting those is, uh, you know, that I wanted to have some some one on one conversations uh, with all the committee members because. Uh, as the work continues, right, and as it ratchets up, what that's going to look like is, and, and really it's always been the case, the work, right, of the racial justice oversight body, right, the work that you guys are charged with does not get done, per se, in these meetings. Now, yes, sometimes we have working meetings and we can draft some language and sometimes people make recommendations and those things seem to move, but most of the action happens in between. Right. So it's following up with things that we say we're going to do in these meetings. And it's, you know, taking on an active role in some of that uh, sort of back end non public facing work so that when we come to a meeting like this, we can report out on what we have done and actually build momentum uh, month to month until we're uh, making good on those agenda items and the things that we're charged with doing. Um, and so I, I definitely want to get on the phone with as many uh uh, our job members as possible just to uh, talk with you and hear from you more than anything about uh, your role or your desired role in some of that work, right? Uh, there are, you know, decent sized work plans for each subcommittee. There may be something on that subcommittee's work plan that you're specifically interested in being a part of or that you think you can summon the energy uh, you know, to do some some legwork on in between meetings. Obviously, uh, I'm not going anywhere. The ORJ will be here to support that work. So it's not like we're trying to shift all of it onto you, but it is important that uh, for folks who are members of the subcommittee, the work isn't here, right? So it's not just about attending these meetings. We want you to attend them for sure, um, but there's the legwork that has to be done in between. And so wanting to suss out for folks uh, where you envision your role in that being. 
um, whether that's, you know, for some people hosting listening sessions and things like that, um, you know, or being part of uh, various opportunities to involve uh, community based organizations and people with uh, lived experience, so on and so forth, just wanting to make sure that we know what those desired roles are, um, and we can help to sort of coordinate and, and uh, assist with making sure that you're playing the role that you envision for yourself so that this work goes forward. Um, so I will be doing that. Uh, Stephanie should be reaching out uh, to, to someone about perhaps uh, playing the second chair role. Uh, and we will, uh, we're looking to start uh, having those agenda planning meetings um, soon, which won't affect most of you. Most of you, are, I mean, obviously, I think I said this in the quarterly meeting, we don't want that to become a big public meeting that has to be noticed and where you have to have the agenda. So we're not looking for 17 people to show up to that. Um, just, you know, a couple of folks um, based on whatever the agenda is and whatever work needs to get done between now and next month uh, to make sure that, um, that, that things continue to move. So those things are, are coming uh, pretty soon. Uh, ball's already rolling. If you haven't seen the email um, that has all these times, well, it has a link that you can click to set a time for a one on one call. Um, I, again, sent it to most of you. I can resend it if I need to. Some of you have signed up already. Thank you for doing that. Um, and I'll continue reaching out that way. And hopefully within the next uh, few weeks, uh, I can talk to each of you. Did I leave out anything, Nicole? No. Okay. Um, so next steps, I think, were number one. Um, I, I will probably come look at look at the uh, at the language again based on some of the conversation that we've had today. But definitely wanting to have the conversation about eligibility criteria based on the work that has been done. Um, so I'll be following up with Ellen and Patrice and and. Uh, Chief Kraus, Chief Eamon Kraus, um, to uh, to make sure that we're all on the same page and we can have that presentation or at least begin uh, looking at that next month. Um, were there any other, what were the other next steps that are missing? That was the biggest call out that, that I was, had. That was definitely the biggest one, <laughs> I think. Uh, I think Cheryl was going to reach out to Ellen about uh, some veterans organizations that could help with, um, you know, with what veterans uh, diversion programs could look like. And barring some significant change, which we kind of expect uh, by the end of this week, we may see you all in person very soon. More to come. Um, yeah, so if there is nothing else, which there certainly isn't on my end, uh, then it looks like we can close this meeting 40 minutes early. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, everyone.